This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Okay, we're back on Monday. I'm Jay Fidel. It's uh, 12 o'clock rock. And of course, that means it's uh, Amina, Marco, and me on Energy in the State of Hawaii. <clears throat> and we have both of them, Mina, Mina Marita and Marco Mangelsdorf, on, on Skype audio. And we are ready to discuss the next subject in our ongoing discussion of uh, uh, energy in Hawaii. So welcome, welcome back to the show, Mina Marita. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Jay. Thanks to be back. Uh, you're in Kauai. Good. Everybody wants, every right-thinking person wants to be in Kauai, except for the right-thinking people who want to be on the Big Island in Hilo. Welcome to the show, Marco Mangelsdorf. Well, and a Heidi, Heidi ho to you, Jay. It's good to be back with my two uh, every other Monday best buds, you and uh, dear Mina Marita. So thanks again for having us on. More and more, I'm convinced that this is an important discussion. We must continue to have it. So anyway, the title of our show is, uh, it's about um, the PUC, and the question, I suppose, is, uh, is the PUC being consistent, and is the PUC predisposed against uh, the electrical, uh, electric utilities in the state growing, um, uh, generating their own, uh, their own electricity? And so this all springs out of, um, I guess, back when um, uh, the PUC gave guidance to suitors of, uh, of next era energy um, in, order, in, in its decision denying disapproving that deal between next era and uh, Hawaiian Electric. And uh, those, those points of decision was in a 17 page addenda in the, in the decision and order disapproving the next era deal. Um, we should take a look at those points and see whether the PUC is, is following those points now itself in dealing with these various applications that are pending before it. And there is a suggestion here in this discussion that maybe they're not being consistent. But Marco, can you review for us what those points were? What was in the famous Appendix A uh, in the decision in order giving advice uh, to people who would be suitors to succeed NEE, Next Era Energy, going forward? Sure, I'd be happy to, Jay. So this comes from the 400-plus page decision in order, which is issued uh, July 15th of 2016 uh, in terms of turning down the applicants, the applicants next era, energy out of Florida, and Hawaii Electric, uh, Hawaiian Electric Industries in Honolulu, their application uh, for uh, next era to purchase HEI uh, without American Savings Bank, and they um, kindly provided their Appendix A, which uh, is guidance, uh, 17 pages of guidance for any future merger or acquisition proceedings, which I just kind of thought, you know, I should go back and read that again just for the heck of it, because I think it's a very telling document, kind of similar in the sense to um, the so-called inclination uh, papers uh, that uh, under MENA the Commission put out in 2014, and it listed six specific key areas, as they called them, uh, that they would be looking at if there were to be follow-on suitors for all or part of Hawaiian Electric Industries. And they start off with, number one, rate payer benefits, two, mitigation of risk, three, achievement of the state's clean energy goals, four, competition, five, corporate governance, and six, the, uh, they describe it, the HECO company's transformation. Can you put some uh, flesh and, on those bones? What does that mean exactly, those six points? Well, I, I'm not going to go through all six points right now, Jay, because we can talk about them kind of maybe sequentially. But the, the, the number one thing that they list, which I think is uh, shows their, their, the, the importance of from one to six in, in, in ranking of importance, ratepayer benefits, that there needs to be the uh, provision of ratepayer benefits that are, quote, meaningful, certain, and direct in the short term. Uh, as well as uh, long-term benefits that are substantial and certain, certain enough to be meaningful. These benefits, let's get more concrete here, these benefits can be provided in many forms, including rate reductions, rate freezes, grid improvements, improvements in safety and reliability, et cetera, but must provide, and here's kind of the, the money phrase, provide net positive value to customers, net positive value to customers. So I guess my point would be, in, in looking at this, this first point here in their, their guidance, 
is that this is a pretty darn high bar that they are putting out there uh, for any possible suitors, follow-on suitors to Hawaiian Electric for all or all are part of the company. Hmm. So I guess the question now is we've had, we've had some decisions this year um, that, that are instructive, um, namely three of them. We've had uh, Hu Honua, we've had NRG Solar, and we, we've had AES uh, PV, Photovoltaic Project on Kauai. Um, so can you, can, you, can you or Mina, Mina, can you tell us what those three decisions were? And then we can evaluate e each one is to, to see whether uh, the PUC advice given in the, in the next era uh, disapproval um, was followed. Okay. Well, I think, you know, Jim, just more, I just wanted to add that in this Appendix A guidance, the PUC said that the focus on these elements would be necessary to meet the public interest standards in any future application seeking control. So this is, this is, this, they set a public standard for um, utility needs. Um, but going, going back to the recent decisions they've made, it is um, sort of baffling trying to find some consistency there. Um, you know, first of all, it, they approved the PSIP, but on the other hand, they have, they approved the um, Honua, and Honua wasn't even factored into their um, uh, the PSIP projection. Mm -hmm. You know, and when they talk about rate payer benefits, you know, one of the things about Honua project. It was approved by the previous commission, but in the previous commission's decision, the um, risk was, was on the developer, not the And I think that's, what some, that's what's troubling with the current decision, the most recent approval. All the risk is being placed on the repair mm -hmm. and, and, and at, at a, quite a hefty sum at that. Um, you know, with um, Mamakua Partners, Mamakua Energy Partners, mm -hmm. that's kind of baffling because, you know, you already have this asset that's been built, that has been operating. Um, the agreement shows a reduction, um, a small reduction to rate payers and um, some good benefits like being able to um have some put some flexibility on the on the grid, and yet that got rejected. Um, and then I think you also mentioned AES of Hawaii. Um, I think that one was kind of simple. You know, you just look at the the the, um, the overall price purchase price, and it's much lower than the facilities of avoided cost. So that was a one to to understand. Marco, um, what's your sense on this? Uh, are, are they remembering their own advice? I think one could one can observe that there's perhaps an implicit bias, if not more than an implicit bias, against uh, fossil fuel generation for I, I guess understandable reasons. But you know, I kind of reiterate what what Mina was saying. You know, to go back briefly over the, the Hamaku Energy Partners' attempted acquisition of that company, which is name, main, uh, owned by a company on the mainland called ArcLight. It was ArcLight that approached Helco late 2015, seeking to sell this power plant, which has about 60 megawatts, 60, 60 megawatts of generating capacity, which is one of the largest on the island and supplies, I believe, somewhere under 20% of all megawatt hours to a Hawaii Electric Light Company uh, customers. So in early 2016, the uh, parties, um, Arclight and Helco, opened a docket to seeking the purchase or the transfer of the ownership of this power plant for $86 million. That would be the, the sale price that Helco would be purchasing for this power plant. And there was a decision in order uh, in uh, May of this year where the commission turned down the uh, the purchase uh, for a number of reasons. And I, I, I read went 
this morning and read reread it um, again to try to glean some more insight. And what I find kind of striking is that, uh, and I'm reading from the decision order here. Although the overall estimated savings remain marginally positive, the customer these customer benefits are small, and in the early years after purchase. Customers are expected to pay more under Helco ownership, thus under the customer value approach. I'm not sure what that is. Under the customer value approach, the purchase can just barely be considered a positive, a positive economic. And you compare that to the recent uh, approval of Huho Nua, which I believe is acknowledged by uh, all or most parties that uh, under the first years of the Huho Nua agreement, once that PPA goes into force, once the plant is operational late next year, that uh, the ratepayers are going to have to be, uh, will be seeing higher bills for the first projected 11 years of the PPA uh, before uh, modest savings kick in. So to me, uh, you know, in a nutshell, kind of uh, not getting into uh, the, all the various other details that one can get into, it seems that uh, there is perhaps somewhat of a lack of consistency between the turndown of the purchase of uh, Humaco Energy Partners plant from Arclight and the approval of the PPA with, uh, with Hu Ho Nua. And interestingly, the, the consumer advocate, state's consumer advocate, suggested in the in the HEP uh, docket that he, in this case Dean Nishina, would be uh, willing to sign off on the purchase of the of HEP if the purchase price was dropped from 86 million to 60 million, which of course is a heck of a, a haircut, which would be in the better interest, of course, of ratepayers. And the commission didn't even bite on that; they didn't even go down the path of considering that a 60 million dollar purchase would be better for rate pairs in 86, they just seem to gloss over that uh, uh, with the concern as well that after the power purchase agreement with HEP, which is scheduled to expire in 2030, uh, that uh, after that point it could conceivably become a so-called stranded investment. So I, I've, I've probably talked enough for right now, but it's just uh, an interesting uh, perhaps lack of consistency that, uh, that kind of struck me in terms of approving who ho Noah and yet not approving, um, not approving HEP, and it kind of led led me to the kind of meta question here: is to what extent is this commission, as well as commissions across the mainland, are they kind of biased against uh, utilities being in the generation business? Because that's been one of the big revolutions of our time over the past decades: is utilities have been getting out of generation and moving often more into transmission distribution. So, you know, that's kind of the meta interesting philosophical question: should should utilities uh, across our unique island chain, should they be dissuaded, which I think you could read the, the HAP decision to be a dissuasion for any utilities across the state to get into, to at least in this case, additional, uh, additional fossil fuel generation. Yeah, we need to get into that. We need to get Marina, uh, Mina Marita's views of it. Right after this break, we'll come back and discuss exactly what the commission's bias is and whether it's appropriate. We'll be right back. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Aloha, my name is Stephen Philip Katz. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, and I'm the host of Shrink Wrap Hawaii, where I talk to other shrinks. Did you ever want to get your head shrunk? Well, this is the best place to come to pick one. I've been doing this. We must have 60 shows with a whole bunch of shrinks that you can look at. I'm here on Tuesdays at 3 o'clock every other Tuesday. I hope you are too. Aloha. You can be the greatest. You can be the best. You can be the king come banging on your chest. You can beat the world. You can beat the war. You could talk to that dog banging on his door. You can throw your hands up. You can beat the clock. You can move a mountain. You can break rocks. You can be a master. Don't wait for luck. Dedicate yourself and you can find yourself. Okay, we're back. Uh, we're live. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Mina Marita and me on Energy in Hawaii. And we're talking about, uh, gee, we're talking about 
the possible inconsistency or apparent inconsistency of the advice that was given by uh, the PUC and its decision in order on the next era case uh, with some of the decisions they've made recently. Uh, and whether built into that is a bias against allowing the utility to generate its own power. Uh, so, and, and all of that against the background of the fact that there are still other suitors out there sniffing around, seeing if they'd like to uh, buy Hawaiian Electric in the, in the way that NextEra wanted to buy Hawaiian Electric, in, including especially 21st century utilities, who's been around for the past year just taking a look at this and maybe would be a suitor to buy Hawaiian Electric. So, Amina, what, what about the history of it? Uh, where, is, where, where, where has this been going? That is, the whole notion of allowing the utility uh, to generate its own renewables. Well, I, I think, you know, there was always an understanding that there may be some assets that the utility has to own in order to ensure reliability. Um, and, you know, and that's all part of the evolution of, of the electric utility company. But I, I think, you know, there's, on the other hand, you know, why not put it out to competitive bid and have the utility participate in that competitive bid process rather than ex exclude them com completely? And if they offer a price that no one else can beat, then, you know, they should be able to build the, the um the asset. Well, it's, um, you know that 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 kind of process seems to me to be a little bit a little bit troublesome in the sense that the utility can can take a look at what's coming down the pike from third party bidders, and knowing what it knows can outbid them every time. Uh, I mean, is yeah. there a, pr a procedure by which the utility would be stopped from doing that? No, and, and I, I think if you look at the KIUC process in um, them acquiring new um, power purchase agreements, you know, they, they set the price and they basically said, this is our price. And if you can be, beat our price, you know, we're going to award you a contract. And that hasn't happened on the HECO side. Yeah. Marco, so what that, do you think? Guess, is, this, is this workable? Can we do this? Can we have the utility bidding against third-party bidders? I'm sorry, are you asking me? Yeah. No, I, I think it's, it's, it's fair game. I think there's enough transparency uh, in our state to allow for a meaningful uh, and fair bidding process. And I think, you know, you, there's a mix of, uh, uh, at least looking at Oahu, you have Hawaiian Electric that uh, is of course, going forward with uh, several uh, projects with NRG to the tune of 110 megawatts, and that PPA was approved uh, recently. And at the same time, they're, you know, after a very, very long time of kind of sitting on the fence, uh, they are moving forward with, uh, from what I understand, uh, owning a PV generation in this, I believe it is 20 megawatt or so deal they'll be doing with the military on, uh, I believe, on the windward side. So I think... Uh, I think there's an openness uh, 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 for all the utilities here, uh, the HECO companies as well as KIUC, to, to look at alternatives or look at the two alternatives of both owning the generating assets, developing the projects, doing the capital expenditures necessary to do it, but also giving major players uh, like NRG and uh, previous to them, Sun Edison, the opportunity to bid because uh, that's been, I think, uh, in the benefit of the ratepayers as well. It will be, I say, once these projects go online at between uh, 10, 11, 12 cents, 14 cents a kilowatt hour. Yeah, and in the end, uh, I agree with you. In, in the end, uh, the PUC is going to see all this information, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to see that uh, who's, who's providing the best price and terms. But, Mina, you know, you said right. that it historically... Um, you, you know, the, uh, the, the, the utility has been, uh, there's a good public policy reason to allow the utility uh, to do its own generation in order to have the reliability uh, where a particular generating uh, asset would, would create reliability. But what about in all cases? It seems to me the utility has been, um, you know, building assets to generate electricity from the beginning of time, back in the early 19, uh, 20th century. Um, so why would you limit it to uh, assets that that provide reliability, or would you include all assets? 
Um, you know, I think I, I I think that's the question that's part of the evolution of the utility business model. Um, you know, there was a lot of discussion in the '90s about um, uh, sort of deregulation and going to a market-based system for electricity. And you know, we we saw in many cases where that has failed. Um, so I think we need to approach this subject gingerly as as we talk about a, a new business model for the um, utilities and mainly because of the um, advancement of technology being, a, you know, where there's a whole lot more visibility on the system and where there are services that you can um, put out to market. But, but again, you know, that's in general of the utility, the electricity sector. I mean, we really need to be concerned on what works on our island and, and how we can protect our island um, reliably and cost effectively and also meet our uh, social goals of providing equity to all customers as we provide the, um, this, this um, essential commodity. And you think that could be achieved by allowing the utility by allowing the utility to partition, participate in the bidding process and to create its own electricity on for all assets and not only the ones uh, that achieve reliability, but for everything that generates electricity? Yeah. So, ah. so Jay, I, can I, I, this is sort of on another tangent, mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm pretty concerned that the decisions that have been coming out have a political tinge to it. You know, whether, whether to allow the utility to build these assets or even, um, the approval of a, a project like Nua, which is not the rate payer interest, but had a lot of politicians weighing in on this project. Yeah, that's troublesome uh, because um, uh, we don't want po politics to influence these decisions. Um, yeah. You know, so I guess there's two, there's I mean, two balls in play here. One is the possibility that politics uh, have influenced the decisions where projects were approved in the case of uh, Hu Honua, NRG, and AEG, uh, and where this whole notion, this bias against allowing the utility to generate its own electricity uh, influenced uh, the decision in uh, Hamakua Energy Partners. Um, how, do we, how do we resolve all that? How do we screen that out? How do we get it on the table and make, make rules that, that uh, exclude these possibilities that we're worried about? Well, you know, I think one of the things is we, we really have to look at decisions and dissect it. You know, for example, on the Fuhonua decision, you go to page 12 of the decision, and they summarize the PPA provision, the original PPA price and the, and the amended new pricing in terms of $2017. You just kind of scratch your head and go, what are you thinking? Yeah, there's got to be a matrix which can compare them accurately. But, you know, um, the whole thing is, yeah. uh, is different than what you would expect because not too many years ago, the notion was that as renewables uh, evolved, uh, the utility would simply become, would, would, would evolve itself into simply a transmission company. But then the technology came around, it became clear that uh, that was that was not the the best. It was that was not the best solution, uh, and that we needed to have all kinds of of uh, diversity uh, and uh, lots of different options and possibilities. And here we are in a place where we're considering that. But the problem is, what is the matrix? What's the what's the vocabulary? Vocabulary? What's the language by which you can most accurately compare the proposals? Uh, and indeed, possibly compare them against proposals by the utility itself, uh, and and follow whatever the guidelines are, especially including those uh, six points in the 17-page addendum uh, that that was written in the decision in order for the next era case that Marco was talking about. Uh, so, Marco, what, you know, what do, what do you think about this? Um, how do we make a matrix that we can all understand that we can? Uh, be able to evaluate all these proposals as against uh, those points or other points 
so we know exactly what we're getting uh, by any bidder who comes along. Well, that's that, that's a great challenge, uh, Jay, in terms of coming up with said matrix, and I think it's beyond my feeble brain and pay grade at this point to, to come up with the, the master plan, but one of the things that uh, strikes me, you know, and all the hullabaloo of supposedly shooting for, and not supposedly, but shooting for 100% renewable generation uh, by 2045 is, I think, the the lack of uh, of recognition that at least for the foreseeable future or at least the near term near term mid term that we or the utility companies on each island will have to maintain a certain level of combustion generation in other words we are not at the point where it could just be batteries 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 solar and batteries wind and batteries this and batteries uh, and just for comparison and uh, that got to thinking after the commission approved Huho Noa okay so that's a 21 megawatt 21 megawatt power plant with the possibility of adding additional megawatts uh, after they're operational. So if you multiply 21 megawatts times 24 hours in the day, which it is, of course, you come up with a nice clean even number of 500 megawatt hours. So potentially there are 500 megawatt hours available from Huhonua burning eucalyptus trees that are being cultivated supposedly nearby along the Hamakua coast. What would you need an equivalent solar PV and, and battery storage in order to match a power plant that's putting reliably 500 megawatt hours a day in terms of power generation. And I ran it by a couple of utility friends of mine, both uh, HECO and KIUC, and they, both, they were remarkably on the same page even though they weren't talking to each other. And that came out to roughly 75, 80 megawatts worth of a solar farm, uh, megawatts in terms of direct current DC. And that there, by the way, there's not uh, any such PV plant uh, of that size anywhere in the whole state right now. So it would be the largest. So 80 megawatts worth of solar and about 375 or so megawatt hours, 375 megawatt hours of, of storage. And by comparison, the KIUC project with, with uh, Tesla and, uh, and Solar City, if I remember correctly, was about 50, 50, 50 megawatt hours. So the takeaway is that in order to replace the output from Huho Nua, which is considered green and renewable, uh, with commensurate solar and storage, uh, is is really uh, something that we and the industry can't do yet in a cost-effective manner. There is no project in the in the country that I'm aware of, let alone perhaps the world, where you have 75, 80 megawatts of solar paired with somewhere close to 400 megawatt hours worth of storage. Now, are we going in that direction? Absolutely. But those who compare who knew it to, oh, you can just replace it with solar. Well, yes, in theory you can, but nobody's really done it yet, and or nor done it cost effectively. So that's an important thing that I'm kind of reiterating, I think, what I heard Mina say, which is the importance of maintaining a certain level for the foreseeable future in terms of combustion generation. And that's one of the points regarding HEP that the consumer advocate made, which I'm just going to read to you this couple of sentences here, which I think is very telling. Uh, the consumer advocate ad acknowledges that under the right circumstances, utility ownership of a generation asset such as the Hamaku Energy Plant Facility may be desirable provided the conditions are in place to balance the potential benefits and risks. Okay, all that makes sense. For example, the consumer advocate notes that the HELCO ownership of the HEP facility would permit HELCO, number one, greater flexibility in dispatching the HEP facility which could facilitate the inclusion of increased levels of renewable energy. Could facilitate the inclusion of increased levels of renewable energy. But again, you know, given the fact that the commission ruled against that purchase, they, they weren't persuaded by that particular argument. Yeah, well, I, it sounds like we ought to get that out on the table if there's a bias against uh, utility running its own. But uh, I think we, we all three agree there's a need for a certain amount of fossil fuel going forward. But I put this question to you, Mina. Um, <clears throat> so as time goes by, uh, the problem that Marco described and, and maybe was uh, central in the HEP decision um, is, that, is that the technology will change. And, and soon enough, uh -huh. we'll find that we can use a combination of solar and batteries um, to achieve cheaper rates maybe as cheap as fossil fuels. And this means that if you want to put in 86 million or 80 million or 75 or 60 million, you may wind up with stranded assets essentially uh, or with a price that's too high, relatively speaking, 
when solar and batteries go down in price. So how do you handle that going forward? Right, and, and that's the importance of a, a low-regret low strategy. Um, that, you know, this is a time we make minimal investments and really increase productivity and efficiency of our existing assets. You know, so, you know, how do we do that? You know, and what scares me is that every decision that has come up so far has a real serious impact on HECO rate payers. You know, we're not offering any kind of uh, uh, relief here. All we're, all we're seeing is increase in pricing right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we should do better. Marco, uh, we're out of time, yeah. but I'll let you close. What would you leave our listeners with? Uh, it's it's pretty head spinning, I think, Jay. I mean, I think the three of us, uh, to be so bold, I think we're reasonably educated people. But I mean, trying to, like you said earlier, put together this matrix from which to make sense and kind of some grand master cheat sheet is is a challenge. There are truly so many moving parts and so many aspects to consider, and it's almost kind of a full time job. <laughs> Well, we can do it part-time here every two weeks on Mina, Marco, and me, okay? <laughs> Thank you so much, <laughs> Mina Marina, Marco Mangelstorf. We'll see you two weeks hence for more of the same discussion on energy in Hawaii. Aloha.